Hello, my name is Dr. Katrin Althans, and in the next couple of minutes, half hours, I'd like to tell you something about Gothic Down Under. Now first, I'd like to advise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that the following lecture contains the names and voices, and may also contain pictures of people who have passed away. Let's see now what we're going to talk about in the next minutes. So first of all, I'd like to give you an introduction into Australian Gothic in general, before I move on to colonial Australian Gothic, then to post-colonial Australian Gothic, and finally to Aboriginal Gothic. But first, Australian Gothic in general. Now for that it is necessary to see what Australia means to a European people. So Australia, Australia used to be Terra Australis Incognita, the unknown Southland in um, early modern times. And you can see that here, on this um, Orbis Terre Compendiosa Descriptio by Michael, Michael Mercator and Romuald Mercator. And here, down there, you can see a landmass, because no one knew what really was down there. They called it Terra Australis Incognita. Whereas, by the end of the 18th century, after the voyages of Captain Cook, there is no more Southland here, but you can already see Australia, very well drawn, very well drawn here, and the shape does resemble Australia as it really looks like, actually. What's more, it was not only a big mass landmass at the end of the world, but because it was from a European perspective, literally on the other side of the world, they imagined it to be peopled by a lot of strange creatures. For example, literal antipodes. It was Europe's other, actually. And here, um, Hartmann Schädel's Weltchronik does show a couple of those creatures. And here, you can see the actual antipodes. Their feet are reversed. So it seems, because of its geographical location on the other side of the world from a European perspective, and also because it was imagined as Europe's other with strange creatures, and because the colonial experience, as Jerry Tocourt writes, is one of isolation, entrapment, fear of pursuit and fear of the unknown, Australia would very readily lend itself to Gothic fiction. Marcus Clarke, one of the best-known colonial Australian novelists, in his preface to Adam Lindsay Gordon's Sea Spray and Smoke Drift, writes of Weird Melancholy, the Australian mountain forests of funereal, secret, stone. Their solitude is desolation. They seem to stifle in their black gorges, a story of sullen despair. No tender sentiment is nourished in their shade. In other lands, the dying years mourned, the falling leaves dropped lightly on his beard. In the Australian forest, no leaves fall. The savage winds showed among the rock clefts. From the melancholy gums, strips of white bark hang and rustle. The very animal life of these frowning hills is either grotesque or ghostly. Great grey kangaroos hop noiselessly over the coarse grass. Flights of white cockatoo stream up, shrieking like evil sounds. The sun suddenly sinks, and the mopokis burst out into horrible peals of seeming human laughter. The natives are worried that, when night comes, from out the bottomless depths of some lagoon, the bunyip rises, and, in form like monstrous sea carp, drags its loads some length from out the ears. From a corner of the silent forest rises a dismal chant, and around a fire dance natives painted like skeletons. All is fear-inspiring and gloomy. No bright fancies are linked with the memories of the mountains. Hopeless explorers have named them out of their sufferings. Mount Misery. Mount Dreadful, Mount Despair. So here you have um, an Australian forest which is clearly juxtaposed to the pastoral idyll of uh, English forests, and this is what it looks like. So on the left hand side you have a picture taken in the Dandenongs in Victoria, whereas on the right hand side you have a picture from the Blue Mountains National Park. This is the kind of Gothic nature Clark describes in his preface, which is so endemic to Australia. And of course, this, this little fella, a sulfur crested cockatoo. This is the shrieking of the evil souls, Clark mentions. Now, a couple of lines onwards, he writes The lonely horseman, riding between the moonlight and the day, sees vast shadows creeping across the shelterless and silent plains. He has strange noises in the primeval forest where flourishes of vegetation long dead in other lands. 
So here, he no longer describes the forest, which is dark and dismal, but describes this one. The open horizon of Australia. In the session on the Gothic in general, you will probably have heard of the sublime and may also have seen the famous painting by Caspar David Friedrich in which a person, a man, is standing on top of a hill. And uh, the sublime, usually in European terms, is one of mountains and valleys. Whereas Bill Ashcroft writes that there is something like an Australian horizontal sublime. And he writes, But in Australia, it is precisely the excess of space that engenders the dystopian terror of an absolute displacement intimated by the psychic line of the Australian horizon in so much colonial art and literature. The Australian horizon was potentially liberating, but terrifying at the same time, because it projected the soul utterly beyond the civilized limits of place. Now this is what um, Bill Ashcroft terms the horizontal sublime. It doesn't go deep down, vertical, but stays horizontal. Now take a look again at those photos. There is nothing but space, nothing but the horizontal. And that is, as Ashcroft argues, the sublime in Australian terms. So now, let's move on to the themes of Australian Gothic fiction. We have the convict experience, the bush, the frontier, the Aboriginal absence as well as the Aboriginal presence, the outback, the uncanny, and the migrant experience. So that's it for an introduction to Australian Gothic in general. Now let's move on to colonial Australian Gothic. First of all, a trope which, is, which features very prominently in colonial Australian Gothic is the convict experience. The only problem there is with the convict experience is its proximity. So Australia, as you know, started off as a penal colony in 1788, and whereas the Gothic needs to be experienced from afar, therefore in traditional Gothic they usually had settings in Italy or Spain, which was decidedly not England, Australia had the problem that even though it was Gothic, or maybe because it was all too Gothic, it just couldn't produce um, Gothic fiction. It was too close, especially so the convict experience. Some readers might even have been convicts themselves. Nevertheless, there is Marcus Clark's For the Term of His Natural Life, in which he describes what convicts were subjected to. Oh, flock the worst, you know. But I don't flog more than a man a week, as a rule, and never more than 50 lashes. They're getting quieter now. Then we iron and dumb cells and maroon them. Do what? Give them solitary confinement on Grammard Island. When a man gets very bad, we clap him into a boat with a week's provision and pull him over to Grammard. There are cells cut into the rock, you see, and the fellow pulls up his commissariat after him and lives there by himself for a month or so. It tames them wonderfully. And there are many more examples of how overseers um, use the power or use the power they have over the convict. And uh, the convict experience is described in Gothic terms because it just is a gruesome and Gothic experience. Another very common trope of Australian colonial Gothic fiction is the bush. And here I have an example taken from Barbara Bainton's A Dreamer in which a woman returns home um, but is not picked up at the station and has to walk all the way to her homestead through um, the Australian forest in the dark and it also, it's, it also is a stormy night. Despair shook her. With one hand she gripped those, those branches, that had served her so far, and cautiously drew as many as she could grasp with the other. The wind savagely snapped them, and they lashed her unprotected face. Round and round her bare neck they coiled their stripped fingers. Her mother had planted these willows, and she herself had watched them grow. How could they be so hostile to her? And again I've prepared a picture. Arguably there are no willows to be seen here, but this is, um possibly the kind of forest she had to walk through to reach her homestead, her home. Now you might say, okay, we have mountainous locations, uh, not mountainous, but uh, we have forest locations and settings in the traditional Gothic novel too, so what's so particularly Australian about it? In um, Australian Gothic, nature is not just the backdrop and a setting through which the damsel in distress is pursued by the villain, but nature is the villain. The nature of Australia is so very alien to white Europeans that they see it as hostile. As the protagonist in A Dreamer writes, how could they be so hostile to her? And she even anthropomorphizes them. They have stripped fingers, the, uh, the tree branches. This is the kind of gothic horror which is inherent in the bush, where nature suddenly becomes the enemy. 
Barbara Bainton has also drawn attention to the harshness of the bush and uh, the situation for women who are left alone by their, by their men who might be drovers, as in the drover's wife, and has gothicized this experience, as in her probably most famous short story, The Chosen Vessel, in which a swagman returns to um, a woman who's alone at home with her baby. The moon's rays shone on the front of the house, and she saw one of the open cracks, quite close to where she lay, darken with a shadow. Still watching, she saw the shadow darken every crack along the wall. She knew by the sounds that the man was trying every standpoint that might help him to see in, but how much he, he saw she could not tell. Stealthily, the man crept about. She knew he had his boots off, because of the vibration that his feet caused as he walked along the veranda to gorge the width of the little window in her room, and the resistance of the front door. Then he went to the other end, and the uncertainty of what he was doing became unendurable. She had felt safer, far safer, while he was close, and she could watch and listen. She waited motionless, with her baby pressed tightly to her, though she knew that in another few minutes this man with his cruel eyes, the sheaver's mouth and gleaming knife would enter. One side of the slab tilted. He had only to cut away the remaining little end, when the slab, unless he held it, would fall outside. And to give you an impression of the situation and setting this might have happened in, this is the kind of hut the woman and her baby probably were living in in the middle of nowhere, with um, her husband being away to work in the bush. Another trope in colonial Australian Gothic fiction is the frontier. And uh, I have chosen an extract from uh, Guy Boothby's With Three Phantoms, which goes like this. As you know, I left Port Darwin on the 24th of September, four years ago, with a party of three men and six pack horses, to seek for traces of Leichhardt's expedition. About 10 o'clock on the day following, we entered the desert pure and simple, an endless sandy plain where no sign of water, animal life or any vegetation whatsoever was discernible, save the interminable and eye-wearing spinifex. Nearer and nearer they approached, that means riders um, approaching this, uh, his little group, till we could almost discern their faces. And still they made no noise. When they were within a dozen spaces they halted. And then, my god, I can feel the horror of it now, I could see the moon shining through each horse and rider. So this is a ghost story which uh, makes ample use of the trope of the lost explorer. So explorers and the frontier, they were kind of unequal because um, the explorer wanted to, to push the frontier farther out from the urban centres. They wanted to know the interior of Australia. And Leichhardt, for example, was never found again. So he started his third expedition, but vanished somewhere, they say, in the Simpson Desert. But no trace of him was ever found. So um, this is actually what uh, the Simpson Desert looks like. And this is the place the person in With Three Phantoms describes. Again, you have the horizontal sublime plus the unknown. Because after the trees, you can see here, there's the frontier. No one dared enter this desert before. No one knows how long this desert might stretch. So the frontier, as a trope in Gothic fiction, is about the unknown, is about the horizontal sublime, and also is about the myth of the explorer. Then of course we have the Aboriginal presence in colonial Gothic fiction. So you might have heard of the distinction between the noble savage on the one hand, and the bloodthirsty savage on the other hand. And of course, you might have guessed, in, um, in Gothic fiction, the bloodthirsty savage looms large. So we have this extract from Mary Gaunt's The Lost White Woman. Ellen Hammond heard it first. She pushed her thick hair back from her ears and sat up and listened. Then her eyes fell on a dark hand beside a tea tree stem. She stifled a cry, and in a moment the scrap was alive with leaping, dancing figures. There came a flight of spears. The old man beside her died with a moan, and the other two scrambled to their feet. But their eyes were heavy with sleep. They had only their fists to defend themselves with, and those black figures, with skeletons marked on them in white, outnumbered them ten to one. But she had not gone half a dozen steps before strong hands were laid upon her. So Ellen Hammond had tried to flee from this scenery. She was turned round sharply, and found herself facing a stalwart salvage with a bearded face smeared with grease, and a piece of bone stuck in his hair. He uttered a sort of grunt of astonishment and admiration. Probably in all his days he had not seen anything so fair as this English girl, 
with the sunny hair about her shoulders and her blue eyes wide with horror and terror. So what you have here is the fair English girl juxtaposed to the black and bloodthirsty savages with skeletons marked on them in white. So there are demons and evil incarnate. And because, because they are the other two white people and furthermore they're savages. On the other hand, there also is the Aboriginal absence which features in colonial Australian Gothic. As in Ernest Faveng's story Doomed, the martini bullet had gone clean through Jin's body and killed the baby she had been nursing. The Jin was still alive. She looked at the white faces still gazing down at her and commenced to talk. What she said, of course, none of them could understand, but that it was the wild tirade of vengeance against the murderers of her child and herself, they could pretty well understand. So the years go by, and uh, of the five uh, white men who killed um, this Aboriginal woman and her baby, only two are left, left alive that is, and uh, they go on a, on a trip with a horse and cart, and one of them has got his wife and baby with them. So the baby was uninjured, and Mrs. Turner was unconscious, while Beveridge's head had been smashed in by the hoof of one of the struggling horses. He was dead. Mrs. Turner recovered, but her unfortunate husband never did. And to the day when a merciful death took him away from the blind earth, whose beauty he would see no more, he asserted that the last thing he saw was the form of a black gin, with a child in her arms, standing in front of the slip rails and blocking the horses. So here, on the one hand, you have quite a traditional tale of a vengeful ghost, but on the other hand, it also tells about the haunting of the Aboriginal absence. So Aboriginal people have been killed in killing sprays, and the white people are now afraid that they might come back and haunt them. And therefore they lend themselves very readily for um, colonial Australian ghost stories. Here I have compiled a very small reading list, which contains um, all the issues and tropes I have mentioned so far. So for example, we have Price Waring's Tales of the Early Days about the convict system, Barbara Bainton's Bush stories, Marcus Clark's For the Term of His Natural Life, as well as a collection edited by Angela Chalice and Marty Young, which contains not only colonial Australian Gothic, but also contemporary Australian Gothic fiction. Uh, then a collection by James Dewick, uh, which is not restricted to Australia as a setting, but also um, contains settings from all over the world. Then Ken Gelder and Rachel Weaver's The Anthology of Colonial Australian Gothic Fiction, with a very good introduction into the topic. William Hayes' The Escape of the Notorious Sir William Hines, as um, also an example of uh, the convict experience, as is The Broad Arrow by Caroline Leakey, written under the pseudonym of Odine Keys. So, that was Colonial Australian Gothic. Now let's move on to Postcolonial Australian Gothic. Let's start with Tasmanian Gothic, which is a subgenre of um, Australian Gothic, if you want. So I have here an excerpt from um, Gold's Book of Fish by Richard Flanagan. Once upon a time terrible things happened, but it was long ago in a far-off place that everyone knows is not here, or now, or us. So this, I'd say, is gothic fiction in a nutshell. Oddly, it, that is a book, book of Gold's Book of Fish, smelled not of the sweet must of old books, but of the briny winds that blow in from the Tasman Sea. I lightly ran an index finger across its cover. Though filthy with fine black grime, it felt silky to the touch. It was on wiping away that silt of centuries that the first of many remarkable things occurred. And here again you have a standard Gothic trope, and that is the found manuscript. But the story goes on. But while it is a matter of historical record that between 1820 and 1832, Sarah Island was the most dreaded place of punishment in the entire British Empire, almost nothing in the Book of Fish agrees with the known history of that island hell. Few of the names mentioned in your curious chronicle are to be found in any of the official documents that survive from that time, and those that do take on identities and histories entirely at odds with what is described in this, this sad pastiche. So um, here we see that Tasmanian Gothic, in a way, in the post-colonial context, is a rewriting of the convict experience, only in postmodern terms. So um, at least Gold's Book of Fish makes ample use of uh, postmodern questions. Um, it questions its own textuality, its own intertextuality, and it also questions the historicity of documents and archival records in, um, in the text. So you could 
to a degree also say that it's some kind of um, historiographic metafiction because it constantly questions the whole act of writing historiography. Another example of Tasmanian Gothic is the movie The Last Confession of Alexander Pierce, which is set to follow the life of a notorious Alexander Pierce who um, is said to have escaped from uh, Port Arthur, or at least from some kind of um, penal settlement on um, Van Diemen's land, and then have lived as a cannibal. So here, this is the filmic example of Tasmanian Gothic. So here in this short trailer, you could see a lot of Gothic features. So we have the scenery, the, the clearly Australian Tasmanian Gothic scenery, we have a very Gothic soundscape, and also we have other visuals like um, changing colour, change in um, how, it's been, how it's been recorded. All that is very, very Gothic. And then on the other hand, we also have, again, this idea of, of a manuscript, which um, purportedly tells the true story, the last confession of, which is sold, uh, not sold, but which is um, kind of marketed here as this is the true story of Alexander Pierce. And in postmodern times, you always have to be aware of titles which tell they are the true story of, because then they are most likely the most fictitious account you can come across. Now let's move on. Now here's a short reading list, again. Those um, titles I have mentioned here all can be considered Tasmanian Gothic, which uh, to a certain degree is, the, is an ongoing convict experience trope of Gothic fiction. And then we have the bush again. These are excerpts from Tim Winton's novella In the Winter Dark, which um, is about five, well, families or people living in five houses in um, in a place called the sink which is surrounded by the bush and there and they are isolated they are kind of trapped there in the sink and also there is something around them in the bush which kills at least it kills um, animals so he turned to go back up to the house the light was failing and he had wood to chop he set off but something stopped him still as a stump. Between the trees, he saw something. A movement. A silhouette. It was travelling. Loping. That was the word that came to him. He squinted. All around him, birds were roosting, or stirring, or something. He heard the tick of his own body. The shadow seemed to stop, slip sideways between apple rows. And then there was nothing. Again? In this text, the bush comes across as menacing, but the further the story um, of In the Winter Dark progresses, the bush takes on some kind of metaphorical meaning. Ida shook. She looked at Maurice. She didn't know him. Not the way a wife should know a husband. There was a terrible cold rushing into her, a winter wind blowing right through. She was a stranger here, and they were impostors. There was just a hollowing wind, and she was going. So the bush here in the winter dark also is um, is a metaphor for this kind of isolation. It is not necessarily, as it used to be in colonial times, the alienness of the bush, even though there is some kind of danger lurking in there, but this danger might very well come from the human inhabitants of uh, the sink. So there also is this um, psychological part of it in post-colonial Australian Gothic. And then we have the outback, and I have to, to tell you something about the difference between bush and outback. It is um, by no means a distinction uh, that can be made because of the vegetation which is growing. It doesn't mean bush um, equals trees and scrubs, whereas outback equals desert. By no means. It's a purely geographical reference. So you have, on the eastern part of Australia, you have the coastal towns, and then next to the coastal towns, farther inwards, inland, you have the bush. And then once the bush stops, which is still pretty close to the coastal towns, you have the outback. And that means that, for example, the Murray River Basin, which does have a big towns in, in it, is considered outback because it's too far removed from the coastal centres. So this is what you have to remember, that the outback does not necessarily equal desert, but can also have vegetation. 
And in postcolonial Australian Gothic, the outback usually features in movies. So there actually is a subgenre of um, Australian horror films, which is outback Gothic or outback horror. And one example of that, those is um, the 1971 um, film Awake and Fright. So again, I have a trailer here, which I want to show you. So here on the trailer to Wake and Fright, you also have the horizontal sublime of the outback, and there there is no scrub, so it does to a degree correspond to the ve to vegetation. And you again had this very eerie soundtrack. And um, in the middle of the trailer, you also had the darkness, you know, from from Gothic, and the whole setting of a very tight knit community in the outback is, it seems, very Gothic in itself. So I have compiled a watching list, so to speak of Outback Horror, starting with um, John Hillcott's The Preposition, which stars Nick Cave, um, who himself is a very gothic figure in Australia. And that is some kind of supernatural western thing in, um, set in the Outback in the 19th century. We have Wolf Creek, which is a very contemporary um, hitchhiking horror movie, and, and very, very gory. We have a classic that is Walkabout, in which a father drives his two children out into the outback, doesn't manage to kill them, but um, and only kills himself, but the children are left alone in the outback, so basically that is a death warrant. But they meet an Aboriginal boy, played by David Gilfillan, and he uh, leads them back to civilization, in inverted commas, that is to um, white cities. Uh, we have Peter Weir's The Cast That Ate Paris, and Peter Weir is a very well-known Australian director. And in The Cast That Ate Paris, there again we have a tightly knit outback community, which stages car accidents, and, um, well, fatal car accidents, that is, in order to get the spare parts from the cars of tourists which accidentally drive through. And of course we have Picnic at Hanging Rock. Um, both the novella and the movie are classics of Australian Gothic. It's about a class from a Melbourne school of girls, and three of them, um, on, a, on a trip out, uh, go missing. And never return, that is. Then, of course, we have Mad Max, and I chose two movies here, Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, Warrior and the uh, fourth installment, Mad Max Fury Road, which some people um, describe as the epitome of outback horror, even though it's, it's quite new and outback horror started in the 1970s. So even though those two are, of course, um, apocalyptic dystopias, they nevertheless show the same traits as outback horror movies, the same horizontal sublime stuff, and you name it. And then there is Black Water, and in this movie you clearly see that there is no telling the outback by vegetation, because it's um, it's about uh, two people setting off on a billabong with their guide, and the billabong is um, is uh, a water pool, can be quite big, but you need a boat to cross it, and um, it might take quite some time to cross this billabong. And uh, billabongs usually also are infested by saltwater crocodiles, by salties. So um, what happens, their boat is, is attacked by a saltwater crocodile, very big one, and they have to survive by climbing on a tree, because there is a lot of, there are a lot of trees around this billabong, and um, have to find a way how to escape this crocodile. Next we have the uncanny. Now first of all let me explain a bit about the uncanny, and use um, Sigmund Freud for that. The uncanny is that class of the frightening which leads back to what is known of old and long familiar. For this uncanny is in reality nothing new or alien, but something which is familiar, and old established in the mind, and which has become alienated from it only through the process of repression. So what Freud is, is telling here is that the uncanny is not frightening because it is unfamiliar, because you don't know it and are afraid of what might happen, but because it's all too familiar. You already know it and you have put it to the back of your mind because you wanted to forget it, but it comes back and it's frightening because you know exactly what it is about. So this the uncanny has by now become a household tomb for discussing postcolonial ghost stories, as do um, Ken Gelder and Jane Jacobs in their postcolonial ghost story. A haunted site may appear empty or, or uninhabited, but in fact it is always more than what it appears to be. To settle on a haunted site is to risk unsettlement, a postcolonial condition which acknowledges, rather than suppresses, the fact of previous, albeit displaced, inhabitation. The postcolonial ghost story 
is thus often quite literally about the return of the repressed, namely the return of the truth, or a truth effect, about colonization. So what they argue here is that um, the uncanny and post-colonial Australian Gothic actually refers back to the Aboriginal absence that was a trope in colonial Australian Gothic. You had a ghost there, which came and haunted, and nowadays in contemporary times, especially so after the Marble decision, which granted native title to Indigenous Australians, white settlers fear to be unsettled from where they live because what they thought were repressed, the Aboriginal inhabitants, might come back and claim their place. So there was um, some kind of general fear after that Marble decision, which granted native title, and native title is the right to to claim access to sacred sites, but there are a lot of restrictions for Aboriginal people to be able to claim native rights and a lot of restrictions for native title to be granted. So this was some kind of populist fear instilled in people like Aboriginal people are claiming your own backyard. There was um, some kind of headline back in the 90s. But it captures um, the whole idea Gelder and um, Jacobs are mentioning, that the settlers become somehow unhinged and unsettled. And one of the best examples for the uncanny in postcolonial Australian Gothic fiction actually is Andrew McGowan's The White Earth. So here, in, um, in the beginning, William, the nine-year-old protagonist, sees the house of his great-uncle for the first time. A homestead, his mother had told him. And William had not really known what that might mean. It was easily the biggest home he had ever seen, built all of sandstone, two stories high, with a roof of grey slate. Wide terraces wrapped around both upper and lower levels. A circular driveway with a fountain in the centre led up to the front steps, a cascade of them, climbing in turn to the porch and the double front doors that locked ten feet high. From here, the house stretched out until it met two perpendicular wings that projected forward from either side, framing the driveway and the fountain. It was the roof he noticed first. The line of it sagged towards the middle, and dozens of tiles were cracked or sliding out of place. The gutters hung loose from the eaves, and below them, the high walls were draped in sullen vines and ivy. The upper veranda was ruinous, and within the shadow of the yawning, William could glimpse second-story windows that were shuttered or smashed. So this basically is the Australian idea of a Gothic mansion. You have an old Queenslander, uh, that's what it's called, but it's, it's ruined. So here we have the first instance of the Gothic, because um, this this uncle of William's, this great uncle, is a very brooding kind of Gothic villain, um, and the house comes together with a sinister housekeeper. But um, what really makes it uncanny is the reference to the White Earth. On the one hand, the White Earth refers to the fact that um, the station was once owned by the White family, but on the other hand, it also refers to the White Bones, which are suddenly unearthed and which let the repressed Aboriginal absence come back to, um, to the fore. And here we have a scene in which William meets the Bunyip and which uh, speaks of this uncanny. Dread flooded into him, for he understood now the, that he had been called here for a purpose. He could feel an old rage within the creature, a long patience that was nearly at an end. The eyes glared affirmation. The rivers have turned dry, graves have opened to the sun. The shape shifted its bulk closer, and the stench of mud was overpowering, a reek of hatred and pain staggering in its force. The dead are ready for you. Then it reared above him, a mountain building itself against the sky, its wild mane shaking, its great talons clawing the air. William fell back in terror, but too late. The bunyip caught. It was a piercing, grating, tearing cry, the sound of death and cold and age, and of long, intolerable loneliness. The earth froze and the stars dimmed. So what actually was laid bare through um, the dried up rivers and the caves which are now open to the sun are the white bones of Aboriginal people who were killed in a killing spree in which the father of William's great uncle took part. So they wanted to get rid, it was in the early, um, early um, 1900s, they wanted to get rid of the last Aboriginal people living there and hit the bones because um, they didn't want authorities to know. And now this uh, presence is coming back to haunt in the form of the bones. 
this this repressed presence and is unsettling because it uh, it takes place in 1993 just one year after the native title after the Mabo decision and in the year in which native title was made law and um, this actually um, epitomizes the uh, the feeling of unsettledness of settlers in the face of the returning of the repressed and then we have the migrant experience in post-colonial Australian Gothic. And for that, I've chosen a novella by Chi Vu called Angulima, A Gothic Tale. A their car, um, there are three Vietnamese men sitting in there, drove through the western suburbs of Melbourne, that is, with neat gardens and milky, overfed children. A land so sparse and peaceful that the newcomers believed that it was empty space, unmarked and unstoried. A barely populated land, uninhabited by wandering demons and limbless men from wars that direct, dragged on for millennia. So here, that is quite quite clever because we just don't know um, who this sentence refers to. Does it refer to the newcomers from Vietnam or does it refer to the newcomers from England? And the old woman remained in a dark mood. We think we left this behind when we escaped. Left what behind, Buck? She said quietly. Women cleaning off, up after men. Dao continued sweeping. Left behind Ma go on, in the old world. Dao stopped. Wandering, hungry ghosts. Unable to be reborn as a human or animal. Unable to enter heaven or hell because of their gruesome, untimely death. We think we have a new beginning because we escaped the terror and came out to a new land. But we haven't left them behind. They came with us. Can't you see it? Vax's gaunt face and grey eyes were unwavering in the morning light. So um, this Angulima, a gothic tale by Chi Vu, is a clever combination actually of combining the migrant experience in Australia, in Melbourne in particular, with the very recent past of Vietnam, plus um, Buddhist beliefs. So um, actually you can take the most out of this story when you know about Buddhism. I don't, but I... I read a text on that and it was quite enlightening because before I have only read it as, well, there are certain Gothic tropes in that and they do roughly correspond to the migrant experience. But if you include the Buddhism part of it too and um, and get to know what Angulima actually is, it makes the migrant or the way the migrant experience is described in Angulima even more gruesome. So that actually was our little journey into post-colonial Australian Gothic and now we go on to Aboriginal Gothic. I have tried to group Aboriginal Gothic expression into tropes like I did with the colonial and post-colonial Australian Gothic, but really Aboriginal Gothic is, is very versatile and very hard to group into tropes. So this is only a try on uh, categorization, which is aware of the fact that categorization just doesn't do justice to Aboriginal Gothic. But let's start now with um, the trope of rewriting. So the idea behind the rewriting paradigm, which was made popular by Bill Ashcroft, Gareth Griffiths and Helen Tiffin in their The Empire Writes Back, is that you have a piece of colonial or let's say writing from the empire, which um, is taken up by writers or um, other artists from the periphery and is being played with, um, kind, of, kind of reversed, uh, rewritten that is. You find that in, for example, White's Agassiz, which rewrites the story of Bertha Mason in of Jane Eyre. The problem with the um, writing back paradigm is that still the um, center of the um, the imperial center remains the center and the point of reference, whereas which comes that which comes from the periphery can only react to this point of reference. And in terms of Aboriginal Gothic, that can mean to just kind of copy. Um, the Gothic we know from European sources, as is the case in Namorador. Namorador is a story from uh, Arnhem Land, told by Pamela Weston and narrated by um, Tom E. Lewis. It uh, featured in a series called Dust Echoes, but has by now undergone quite some changes. And the version you find now on the website of um, ABC Education, for example, is the one without narration. But here, this is the original file, which was originally published by Dust Echoes. Mm -hmm. 
What you can see here in this short beginning of Namorado is a very gothic scenery which could be anywhere in the world and is not necessarily unique to Australia it seems. What is unique to Australia though is um, is Namorado, the beast, the, the titular beast, which is um, a monster from Aboriginal cosmology. And the problem I have with this, it is also very gothic. I mean, you have this moon which suddenly turns into an eye, um, into the eye of Namorado. It does remind a Western audience of the Gothic, and it seems as if they were only copying Western concepts and um, Western ways of visualization and also Western soundscapes to bring across a story of a story which comes from within Aboriginal cosmology. So this is the kind of problem I have, and the kind of um, kind of problem people have when it comes to rewriting. Another way um, Gothic fiction has been rewritten is that of reversing the roles. You do remember the idea of the or the trope of the Aboriginal presence in colonial Gothic fiction when there were the bloodthirsty savages, skeletons painted on them. In Aboriginal writing, for example in Madrura's The Undying, you find um, an English vampire, a female English vampire who feeds on Aboriginal people and infects their identity. So this scene is taken from when Amelia, that is the vampire, for the first time meets the female protagonist of The Undying. The female, um, Aboriginal female protagonist, that is. How strong and how rich her blood will be. I leave off all pretense, and as my face comes up, I sink my fangs into her neck. Her rich red fluid gushes into my mouth. At last I have her, I know I will suck her dry. Suddenly I gag, ouch myself out from her arms and vomit. Her blood reeks of the sea and is harsh like fish oil. Visions of my mother giving me cod liver oil come into my mind and I wretch again and again. You're one of those blood suckers, the woman says within my mind. Well, my blood is too strong for you. Now what am I to do with such a devil? So here you can see how the roles of um, who is the damsel in distress, who is the gothic villain, and who is the bloodthirsty savage are all mixed up. So um, we have basically no damsel in distress, or if we take the whole novel, the damsel in distress might be George, um, the, the half-blood narrator of the story. We have uh, the gothic villain, who is an English vampire and not a bloodthirsty savage. And then we have the gothic hero, um, who's the whole mob of Aboriginal people. So with The Undying you find a lot of the controversies and ambiguity that surround the writing back paradigm as The Undying intertextually references um, Bram Stoker's Dracula in a number of ways. So um, that starts with a reversal of roles and um, the English vampire, um, whereas Dracula actually was um, considered a tale of reverse colonization, infecting the English masses, which was finally averted of course, whereas in Australia it cannot be averted. The, the protagonist finally is infected by Amelia's vampire blood. And some of the criticism levelled against this could be that why do we have this, this European classic as a point of reference? Why not create something of their own uh, to show their own creativity of Aboriginal writing? Now, um, to that I can say that, um, especially Madruru in his vampire trilogy, because there, there are two more books to that, um, does so very well. He incorporates Aboriginal beliefs, he incorporates Aboriginal ways of um, oral story storytelling so that Dracula is just one of the many intertextual references or let's say um, intercultural references Madhuru draws on and by no means the only one. Just in terms of Gothic it is one of the, the brightest references. Another category I have discerned in Aboriginal Gothic is reclaiming. And with reclaiming, I mean they are investing indigenous cultural heritage with power once more. So the step before that would have been that um, white people actually looked at other cultures for cheap thrills and horrors, which um, were um, exotic and which could be used as an exotic source of, um, of horror to sell, so commodify cultural identity. And now in some examples of Aboriginal Gothic, this idea of how Aboriginal culture could be the source of a, some kind of exotic Gothic um, is turned upside down. I have here an example from Sam Watson's 1990 novel The Kadaicha Sang. 
Tommy waved his fingers underneath his jaw and a red glow lit his face. Tommy's voice was dead, lacking all human quality. His eyes were black scars, empty of life. What we're talking about here is the Kadaicha, which is a character of revenge. And Tommy is this Kadaicha. And um, so on page 117, you actually find the Kadaicha being described in very gothic terms. Because the Kadaicha was used as a trope of gothic horror for, for cheap thrills in uh, numerous popular culture versions. But then it goes on. Black night was all around him, and he was alone. The warehouse had gone, and there was only the green and brown of a small borrowing. Beyond the boundary of the circle, there was nothing. The stones that made up the sacred circle stood out like teeth. A dreadful keening reached up from deep below and smacked at his eardrums. There was chanting all around him, and he was hammered to the ground by a swirling mass of spirits. The phantom horde swooped up upon him, flailing at him with skeletal hands that tore at his hair and his eyes. So here again, this is a scenery full of gothic horror, a recognisably gothic, um, if you summon up the picture in your mind. But the point here is that it's all a ceremony, a ceremony of revenge, which is part and parcel of Aboriginal culture. And by self-consciously describing it in those terms, this part of Indigenous cultural heritage is reclaimed by Aboriginal people, for Aboriginal people, and somehow torn from the grasp of what white people did to this cultural heritage. And in a, in a very Aboriginal, indigenous way, this story of the Kadaicha was kind of handed down from father to daughter, because 30 years later, Nicole Watson, daughter of Sam Watson, published a novel, The Boundary, in which um, the central figure is Red Feathers, also some kind of revenge bringer, which is clearly taking up the Kadaicha figure of the earlier novel. Her heart sang when she saw him again, at the court yesterday flying above the judge's head. Few of the living ever hear the screams of the dead. Red Feathers, on the other hand, is followed by voices constantly. And he sees everything, the living and the dead. Whenever his feet touch the bitumen, the cries of the spirits vibrate beneath them. The most chilling are the parents who wander the streets, calling out the names of the lost children. Last night, Ethel and Red Feathers saw Downers, so Downer was a white man who killed Aboriginal people, saw Downer's spirit loitering at the top of the hill. At first, Red Feathers thought that Downer had chosen to spend his death protecting the boundary, and the boundary was a demarcation line within the city limits of Brisbane, which Aboriginal people were not allowed to cross in the night, so it was kind of demarcation line protecting the white people in, in, in Brisbane city centre from the evil, bloodthirsty savages outside, and we're not talking um, 18th or 19th century here, but we're talking 20th century. He wanted to confront him, but Red Feather soon realised that Downer was on the hill by way of punishment. So again, here in this description, we have a lot of gothic ideas, but um, the gist of it is that all that is part of reclaiming Aboriginal heritage and Aboriginal culture from what has been made of it by the hands of white people. So maybe we, and, and this lets us think about if we can really term it Aboriginal Gothic, if Gothic in fact is the right word for it. Is it only because we as um, white people raised in, with a Western background, Western European background that is, seem to recognize it as being Gothic? Or should we say, well, it is from a European perspective Gothic, but from an Aboriginal perspective it is something entirely different. Quite recently, the TV series Clever Man which aired on um, ABC, Australian Broadcasting Corporation, from 2016 to 17, which is a, a TV series featuring the, uh, featuring the supernatural. Um, it's a superhero tale with Aboriginal superheroes and stuff like that. And it also, in episode 5, A Man of Vision, contains an, a scene which is reminiscent of exorcism. But it's entirely different because it's not exorcism of the Roman Catholic kind, but it's a smoking ceremony of the Aboriginal kind. So even though the beginning of the scene um, lets you believe that it's that you've got to expect a very classical exorcism scene, very gory, because um, the older woman is telling the other one to leave because it's not safe, what follows is very peaceful. We have very peaceful music, we have very peaceful singing, we have, um, we have the smoke, we have very calm and peaceful movements. 
And also at the end, when um, the ghost is set free, it is still peaceful and it's all about forgiveness because actually Cohen, the one who's performing the smoking ceremony, was the reason why the little girl was killed in the first place. So he asks for her forgiveness. And at the very end of the scene I gave you here, Cohen is somehow awakened to his cultural heritage because before, so he is to inherit the, the clever man status from his uncle, but he doesn't want to. But here, he actually accepts this cultural heritage. And the exorcism scene you've just seen is by no means gory or gothic, but it's very peaceful. So what could be termed gothic from a European perspective, European perspective is being reclaimed by Aboriginal artists and it's been taken back to its cultural origins. Another example of reclaiming is Warwick Thornton's website The Other Side Project, which accompanies his, uh, his movie The Dark Side. And I have actually recorded this website for you to, to see what it's, uh, what it's like. So this is the start page where you can choose between The Dark Side, which is the movie, uh, which also filmed at the Berlinale, and then The Other Side, which is the website project. When you click on the other side, you are being led to, to a compendium of stories and Warwick Thornton says it's supposed to be an online archive of Aboriginal ghost stories. So this is all very gothic it seems. Listen to the music listen, and, and look at the background. Hello? Hello? Is there anybody there? And also the app, which is uh, quite cool to have actually, makes use of that because um, you're supposed to, to listen to ghost stories in a very dark corner where you want to listen to it. And the idea behind that is somehow that it is framed as ghost stories in, um, in the European sense of it. But in the end, the stories you have there are very calming. Well, you do have um, you do have vengeful ghosts, you do have ill ghosts, but there also are very calming and peaceful stories, ghost stories, and this is what Aboriginal Gothic tells you that you can't measure it by European standards, but that you have to find some kind of new measure for Aboriginal Gothic. And I haven't so far come up with any better word than Aboriginal Gothic, therefore I'm stuck with it. But I'm still thinking about it, and you may want to think about it too. If you can find a better word to describe this particular thing, this particular cultural expression, which is on the one hand making use of what we could term um, Gothic, but on the other hand is absolutely and completely transforming that to their own cultural ends. A trope which corresponds to the trope of the uncanny in post-colonial Australian Gothic is that of returning. But um, at the hands of Aboriginal artists, the idea of returning and of ghosts usually also includes trauma. And here we have an example from Vivian Clavin's Her Sister's Eye, in which a guy called Archie Crivaldo comes to, to some small town in the outback, I think it is, and he has repressed that, he actu that actually this town, Mandra, is his hometown, where he witnessed the killing of his sister Belle um, at the hands of, um, of the white town's patriarch. So, in true trauma fashion, this is all coming back to him now, and this is how it's been described. The sight of Archie's face drops angrily, and the pain spreads to the back of his neck. Already he knows where it's going. He crashes back into the undergrowth, howling like a cornered animal. Archie! Archie! The voices are sounding from the bushes, but he can't move. He waits for the void that will claim him, and somewhere in the far reaches of his mind he tries to hold it back tries to keep it down like always. It's closer now, he can feel the fingers of pain crawling along his scalp. A red film crosses his vision. It's almost here now. Archie writhes on the ground, burrs and twigs digging into his flesh. Above him somewhere Archie hears noises. They've come for him. Leave me alone! Leave me alone! He screams as the dark rivers of pain wash over him. Help me! Raymond! Raymond! Help me! So here, this is a classic example of trauma narrative, um, in that the narrative itself is mirroring the psychological symptoms of trauma. That there is a traumatic event which has been put by the brain, because the brain just couldn't process it, put to the back of the mind, um, so that it could not enter memory, that it could, well, not be processed. And um, some events do trigger this, and Archie, in this case, is at a moment when 
this um, this trauma was re was triggered and the trauma comes all back. He tries to hold it back, tries to keep it down like always, but it just doesn't work because of the tri trigger. And it's all fragments. It's fragments of narration, fragments of sentences until finally it comes back. And that is the last sentences actually um, are a, a rendering, a narrative rendering of how his sister um, screamed for help. So Archie actually is called Raymond, the one she calls for help to. And um, in the end, it is too much for Archie himself, so he drowns himself later on. But the whole story, which has also been repressed in the whole community, both black and white, the whole story comes to the fore and then enters collective memory. So it is no longer a communal trauma, but rather collective memory of that town. It has returned. Another example of how trauma is, is returning is Beckhold's short film Plains Empty. This film starts off as a very conventional ghost story, and um, maybe you were reminded of Ernest Paving's Doomed, where the Aboriginal ghost derails the horses, as the ghost of the Aboriginal girl here derails, kind of derails, the car. But then afterwards, it takes a very different turn. The female protagonist, the one who is driving the car, actually finds a photo showing this girl and her neighbour tells her that actually um, she was a servant girl to the guy who, well, owned the shack um, the protagonist is living in now. The neighbour also tells her that um, this girl somehow someday vanished when she was looking for her master's dog. And in my dissertation, which is concerned with Aboriginal Gothic, I read it as no one cared for that girl. Um, everybody searched the dog, but when this girl disappeared, in search of the dog. No one cared. But when I prepared for this lecture, another thought crossed my mind. Maybe the master even killed the girl. The result is the same. No one cared for that. And the movie again visualizes, like we had with her sister's eye, Vivian Clevens' novel, visualizes the idea of trauma when the camera is left outside and the gaze is not allowed into the hole in the ground where the protagonist finds the lantern and possibly also the bones she later on um, buries. Um, through this burial then the Aboriginal ghost is set free and this could also stand for once the memory of the story and of the girl is unearthed and, um, and laid to rest properly there comes this peace again that we had with the smoking ceremony too. So this is another take on the idea of, of returning and of haunting and of ghost stories at the hands of Aboriginal artists. Another trope I have discerned, and which is, well, in a way anti-Gothic, uh, some might say, is that of a Gothic reality. Now you have learned that for Gothic fiction, everything which happens needs to be far removed from the reality of the readers. The problem with Aboriginal Gothic is that Aboriginal reality or reality for Aboriginal people, more often than not, is Gothic in itself, and Aboriginal artists make ample use of that. So here we have a clip from Scout, directed Cody Bradford, and Scout is part of a five-part series called Dark Places, in which um, Aboriginal writers and directors tell um, Gothic and horror stories. Of those five, four deal with classic Gothic monsters. We have vampires, we have witches, um, we have ghosts, and we also have zombies. This here, um, Scout, has nothing of that sort, but has a Gothic reality. Now look for yourself. This clip I showed you actually starts off like a thriller, I'd say, with the woman abducted in her home while preparing food, and then takes on a very distinctive Gothic quality which makes use of a number of gothic tropes and uh, stock elements. We have um, a subterranean, well, kind of passages or even dungeon. We have an aristocratic male white villain. We have three damsels in distress. We also have um, a prison gadgets, iron and chains. The only thing which uh, is not gothic about it is that it's not far removed, but that it is happening in some Australian city and that it stands in for a lot of victims of human trafficking who have to face that fate every day. Plus, at the end, um, the idea of damsel in distress and, um, and villain is reversed because actually the damsels in distress uh, rescue themselves and set other 
um, damsels in distress free as well. So this is what I mean by a gothic reality of Aboriginal life, because it is not too far-fetched to think of Aboriginal women being abducted for the lust of white men. Another, this time literary example of a gothic reality is um, Kim Scott's most recent novel, Taboo. Our hometown was a massacre place. People called it Taboo. They said it is haunted and you will get sick if you go there. Others just bragged. We shot you and poisoned the waterhole so you never come back. We had heard all this, and we heard it again as we lifted ourselves from the riverbed and went back up the hill into town. Some of you may wish to imagine our decaying flesh, our shuffling tread, and a collective moan emanating from our slack jaws. As if we were the undead, indeed. It was never like that. And we are hardly alone in having been clumsy, in having stumbled and struggled to properly speak and breathe and find our place again. But we were never hungry for human flesh or revenge of any kind. Our people gave up on that payback stuff long a time ago, because we always knew death is only one part of a story that is forever beginning. So here, um, Kim Scott is using gothic tropes as well, and in another act of reclaiming, investing them with um, Aboriginal indigenous cultural values. And then he goes on. One may as well begin once upon a time, except this is no fairy tale. It is drawn from real life. Here you again have Gothic fiction on the one hand, Aboriginal reality on the other hand, and the two are merged together and the fiction is taken from that and replaced by reality so that we have an Aboriginal Gothic reality. Well, this actually was my journey into Aboriginal Gothic and here I have again compiled a reading list which contains um, basically reading and this list is by no means um, exhaustive and also a watching list, viewing list which contains movies, short films and the like. So if I hooked you now, you got interested, check out the Aboriginal Gothic stuff I've listed here, look in the internet, find um, other Gothic stuff you're interested in and maybe think about the term Aboriginal Gothic. Can we still use it or do we have to find a different term? That's it for now. See ya.